Well, I was going to ask if you'd mind the same thing, to be honest. No, I, no, no problem. It just, it, uh, uh, I just l- l- like it that way. And is it okay if I publish it on my podcast? Uh, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I've, 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 obviously, I'm, I'm strained by what I can ask you about if I am. Um, yeah, if I You're do. not constrained from my point of view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, what I'm, what I'm really interested in is... Yeah. I won't use his name because obviously we're possibly talking in public, but um, there's a mutual friend of ours who uh-huh. is um, very interested in uh, low energy nuclear reactions, cold uh-huh. fusion uh-huh. and um, exotic vacuum objects. And uh-huh. um, I'm writing a book on UFOs, UAPs, okay. yep. and uh, trying to do it as a serious insect investigative journalist um, talking to primary sources and um, trying to break through the, the barriers of secrecy with some success and mm-hmm. some difficulty. But uh, w- what it has convinced me is that if this phenomenon is real, there has to be a propulsion system and energy technology that is not yet acknowledged within known terrestrial science. That's, mm-hmm. uh, it leads me to the obvious question, is that technology some kind of plasma technology because so many of these ob- objects are uh, showing some kind of plasma around them. I've, I've interviewed US pilots who um, describe uh, this kind of blue plasma over the object which they're looking at, which has no visible means of propulsion, no known terrestrial acknowledged form of lift such as wings or um, you know a balloon lift or anything like that it's uh, mm-hmm. completely and utterly alien and so I guess I'm 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 wondering whether in your travels what conclusions you've reached about the plausibility of alternative propulsion systems that might explain um, what I'm looking at with unidentified or unidentified objects and and whether you think that we're on the cusp of a propulsion technology or maybe an anti-gravitic technology that has not yet been acknowledged. Well, I don't know if you saw my um, How Did They Build Man, Nan Madol. No, uh, I, I didn't. I, okay, well, I, I seriously recommend you go and look at that video. Um, yep. On the 31st of December. Yep. I, I really haven't watched much TV during my adult life. <laughs> I and, don't blame you. Most of it's drivel. <laughs> well, and I, I grew up in a household with one black and white TV it. and three channels, and all of it was boring. You know, the most exciting thing was the test card that turned on if you managed to stay up late enough to see it. I can tell you this, Bob. The <laughs> thing that I am most excited about is... As somebody who's worked in high-end mainstream media for much of the last 35 to 40 years, Mm -hmm. I am gobsmacked, absolutely gobsmacked, that the mainstream media is not crawling all over this story. It blows my mind. I'm going to give you two exclusives in this conversation, and they are are foundational for me, Um, and I have not made these public. Um, uh, so, um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about those, but I just want to do the lead in, which was, as I said, on 31st of December, it's locked down here and, uh, it was, you can't do anything after nine o'clock outside. So you, you've experienced that in Australia. So you know what I'm talking about. Sure. And so I thought, you know, God, maybe I'll have a look at some of this ancient alien stuff. Uh, so, um, I, I the reason was is because it just popped up on my Amazon Prime account. Okay, this is not an am- advert for Amazon. It just happened to be there when I sure. went on it, um, and it, it had series. It said that you have access to series one, two, and three. I didn't know how many series there were, and and and, and I thought, well, let's start at the beginning, episode one. This is so ancient I, aliens you're watching. The guy, with the, the guy with the weird hair. Yeah, you know what. <laughs> I'd like to say I didn't notice that, but I did. But I don't think he cares. I think it's a it's a feature. He, he oh, likes it's a that. trademark. Good on him. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, if, I, if, if he I didn't have it, everyone would probably go, make oh it my weird God, as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah, I'm looking at this program, and I'm thinking, hold on, 
I, I already the, the thing that they're talking about in uh, this, uh, other than the fact that the video quality was obviously low definition and uh, stretched to high definition, and and it was re repurposing a lot of media. That that didn't matter so much as the point was, I'd already realised by um, uh, January uh, two thousand and seventeen that this technology family would explain all of the megalithic structures. And the slide that I shared in that Nan Madol pr presentation um, was, uh, uh, ha had several of the, in fact, all of the sites that they mentioned in that, that first ancient aliens. And I'd already- can I, be a, can I be a pedant for a moment and ask how you spell Nan Madol? Yeah, you see, I get this wrong because I only found this out the following day on the 1st of January this year. And I still spelled, said it wrong, but it's N-A-N, M A D O L. Oh, I got it right. Okay. Yep. Is my pronunciation. Is that, is that on? Is that best found on YouTube? Uh, uh, you can go to the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project uh, right. channel, Terrific. and you can see it. Uh, it in the description. It should have a link to my uh, blog, which is called RemoteView.icu, and that is right. a podcast and um, uh, a written. Uh, blog. If I'm doing a podcast, I almost always uh, write the text down of that. And it's a newsletter, so it can't be destroyed. Anyone who subscribes to the newsletter, they get it in their inbox. So if for whatever reason it gets taken down, I, you know, the, the content is still available to all those that were members of the newsletter. So um, sure. to try and keep some persistence. Anyway, the, the nature um, uh, of this second program was about this site called Nan Madol, and I'd never heard of it. I'm 49. I must confess I haven't, no. Well, it's closer to you than it is to me. It's two and a half thousand oh, really? miles off the uh, east-west coast of Australia, in the middle of, what? not quite the middle of Pacific. It's 250 kilometers from the, the US Pacific testing grounds. Oh, at Johnson Atoll? Uh, not Johnson Atoll, the other one. The, the, Ma the Marshall Atoll. Islands. Atoll. In a Weetak Atoll, where they dumped. Because oh, I've been the, up there. I mean, it's quite scary. I, I, I went there once because we had a corrupt minister of government here who was doing naughty things in the Marshall you had Islands. A corrupt minister of government. I know it's a shocker. I didn't think yeah. they existed. Carry on. But um, we <laughs> went from Hawaii through to Johnson Atoll, yeah. and it's it's really cool. They make you feel welcome because the plane lands, and there's a guy with a 50 caliber machine gun pointed at the plane. And you're told on the cabin audio, if you get off this plane, you will be shot. It's really, <laughs> and, and, and it's where they were, um, it, it's where the American government, the military were basically dismantling all their chemical weapons and, right, and right. destroying them in huge incinerators. And uh, uh, sadly for the local indigenous folk, uh, it was deemed a good dumping ground for old nuclear waste and excess chemical weapons. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I, while I was there, I, I mean, to my shame, I, I did the story about the corrupt politician and left town, but, um, ah, oh, it's a tragedy in Melanesia. All those beautiful people are suffering long-term radiation injuries as a result of the exposure that they've had to low-level nuclear exposures caused by the mm -hmm. bomb tests 30, 40 years ago. Yeah. And, yeah, and in fact... I, when I realized what this technology can do most easily, I wanted to focus on radiation remediation and specifically to deal with Fukushima, um, Chernobyl and, and Enuitak Atoll, because Enuitak Atoll is the biggest threat actually probably to the Pacific um, in terms of mass radiation. I know, I know, you know, you might consider it to be um, uh, Fukushima, but Fukushima is on the mainland, and you know people can at least be there to deal with it quite quickly if there's something happening. Enemy attack atolls in the, literally in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> anyway, so there's this place called Namadol. Now I'm I'm, I'm going to go back a little bit in in my history, uh, and this project that we set up in South Korea, called the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Basically, Martin Fleischmann, I'd love to have met him, and he died three weeks before the conference and so I didn't ever get to meet him um, but I realized at the conference as did four other people that were there that um, this technology was real this technology that they called low energy nuclear reactions and uh, I could see the thread in different people's research but the, the problem was is that uh, everyone wanted to win the Nobel Prize uh, 
everyone that got really successful, some investor came from somewhere and basically said, don't talk about what you know. <laughs> or, they, or, or someone came in and got them to spin plates until they died. And that's the problem. Mm. You, you know, so it wasn't going anywhere. So I thought the only way this is really going to work is if it's completely open. And, you know, I've come up with a lot of different concepts with, with how to uh, do certain things. And I thought I could, I could really do something here. And there was a, a guy there um, called Ryan Hunt, whose father had developed a little uh, sort of embedded controller system for monitoring power in houses. And he can, thought he could repurpose that to deliver what I wanted to do, which was deliver science real time on the internet. Okay. Anyway, that's just the, the foundational sense. We set up the project. Now, within a year and a half, we had our, I, I think, our biggest donor. He's been one of our biggest donors for a while. I, I won't mention his name. Um, but he, 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 for a reason, he, 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 was, he was running a business that was um, using heavy oil for a number of years and large, vast quantities of it. And given the country that he's from, um, he took on some guilt for doing that and sold that business and bought into another um, business that, that was, you know, he could be more comfortable with. And he's a f fantastic uh, steward of that business. And uh, I had the pleasure of meeting all of his staff once and um, they basically love him. He's one of these leaders who cares, even after someone has, left the business and, and, and gone to join the competitor, he'll still invite them to the public events. Oh, so lovely. the company events. He doesn't hold any malice. So he's, oh, good. he's a very special person. And, and he's one of the he's one of the sponsors of, if you like, of the he, he has been one of our project. biggest sponsors. Um but um because I was going to ask you how do you do this? I mean it's obviously very incredibly a great difficulty. Great difficulty. And, are you and the only fact, person that run it or uh, is are there other people involved? Yeah, we, we've got three directors at the moment, and most most of the core work come. The, the project was set up as a as a way to test other people's claims. We're not trying to invent things necessarily, or, although when you get a sufficient understanding, you can at least put ideas into the field, which sure. we have done, and people have acted on those, and they've come back to us. So the whole thing is 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 about this virtuous cycle. And um, in, the, in the case of this particular, particular sponsor, I mean, the, the people that have put most into the project are actually the project researchers. And, and in some cases, they put many tens of thousands in. And oh, great. in my case, eight and a half years. And I came from an extremely well-paying job because yeah. it was boring. I thought, I don't want to spend my life and get to the end of my life and look back on my life and go, I made a lot of other people rich. Uh, I was at the top of a business. I was getting a big paycheck, but I was spending it out on my cost of living because of where it was or whatever, for whatever reason. And what have I got to show for it? There's, the, the, you know, people like to leave a mark, whether, whether it's a famous quote or whatever. You, there's there's got to be some motivation in life. And please give me faith. Please make me feel reassured about this because I'm doing something slightly similar in the sense that I've stepped away from a mainstream investigative journalism No, I, if you're going to step away at any time, you're, you're, you're doing it at the right time. Yeah, because I mean, I, I, th I think the whole television, free to air television industry is dying. It's moribund, but more importantly than anything else, it's not engaging in an, in an inquisitive way with the stories that need to be told. And and this one, UAPs, alternative energy systems, alternative propulsion systems. Uh, I mean, my luddite brain has understood for some time that there is. A really cracking good bloody story there and uh, somebody's got to dig it up and I've been waiting for somebody to start nibbling at it and my friends Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal from the New York Times have have done some noble work yeah um, credit to them credit to them yeah yeah but the, the thing that really shocks me is I, I've just finished a book it's at the moment it's about a it's way too long. It's about 140,000 words, so I've got to hack it back. But um, I'm gobsmacked at some of the stuff I've dug up. And because of COVID-19, I've had to do most of my work over the phone or on encrypted apps or over Zoom or Skype. And the thing that has really impressed me has been how time and time again – what I did was I, I followed the strategy of people aren't going to want to talk to me if I leave a trail. 
So if I leave an electronic trail to Joe Bloggs, the the scientist who's probably working on anti-gravitic technology, he's not going to want to talk to me. So I found, with the help of our mutual friend in many cases, um, a lot of home addresses of very interesting high-level people all over America, and in fact all over the world, and wrote them letters. And I didn't really expect to get that many letters back or calls back. But uh, very slowly, uh, I've got Telegram and Signal, you know, the encrypted apps. I've got mm. WhatsApp, which is increasingly less secure. I have Proton Mail. Very slowly, stuff started dribbling in. And sometimes people were talking anonymously, but it blew my mind because it made me realize you're absolutely right. There is an incredible story out there that is just bobbing under the surface of mainstream media coverage that nobody's looking at. Like, you know, they're, they're in the water, sitting above the water, looking at the, the sky and everything around them, but they're not looking under the water and actually digging. And the thing that blows me away is I'm so frustrated because people are probably going to find my book interesting, but I'm now going, oh, Christ, I, I'm almost embarrassed to publish it because it's, I now know so much more since I started researching it. And I'm, now I know as I come out of talking to you, I'm going to find myself thinking, oh, Christ, why didn't I go down that path or that path? And the thing, though, that I've been really heartened by is the willingness of people to engage. And there's a beautiful... There's an exceptionalism about America I don't particularly like, but there is a beautiful willingness to share science and ideas and to have intelligent conversations that I really admire in Americans in particular. I've seen it everywhere really else in the world as well, but there's, there's, a, there's a joke I've had many years that I think Americans have an extra strand of DNA. They, 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 they understand the media in ways that other countries don't. And I think it's because they've had TV for so long mm -hmm. and they just get it. They deliver sound bites. They speak mm -hmm. clearly. They, they, they kind of intuitively understand the importance of media. I think it's drummed into them in civics classes mm -hmm. in school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas frankly, you and I, I mean, I'm, I, I used to be a Brit and I know you used to be a Brit and here in Australia, we've got the same problems. The Brits try and classify everything you know they're, they're, they are obsessed with secrecy and um, yeah. you know if it's a menu in a restaurant in the middle of the defense signals directorate in australia or the um, gchq in england they'll they'll classify it because it might jeopardize national security whereas here in america i have been blown away by the willingness of people at a high level in defense and intelligence and science to engage and I they maybe, want... so, so I think maybe some of that comes from um, the fact that a lot of the core research for this was done a good number of years ago these people they, they, they've got their pension assured and there's not much left of it to run or some some of them uh, have got other means and so they don't care and they do realize that the, the information it should be out there and it's unreasonable to for it not to be out there and and when I when I give you some more context about my story um you'll you'll realize i think and i would hope you would realize that um uh you shouldn't fear giving the information out because it's it's actually our human right it's it's it's, it's as much as right to life and the pursuit of happiness you know it's it... i completely agree with you i i, I mean i the, the thing that i've had several people say to me, including a serving member of the US Defense Department, is it's outrageous that this has been kept secret for so long and that there's no reason, there's no good reason for it to have been kept secret for so long. And indeed, what I'm wrestling with is well, explaining... Well, I can give you several, but we, uh, hold that, pin that thought, but I can give yeah, you several. Well, let's, let's, let's hear it. I'd love to hear your analysis. <laughs> well... Step, stepping back to where I was in in the key points and the reveals that I want what I want to give you, um, the this this individual, uh, as I said, he had been a principal funder of the organisation, 
Um, and in fact, in a couple of years, we could not have achieved some very significant milestones had it not been for his support. But that's not to um, take away from the literally thousands of people that have sent like ten dollars. You know, that adds up and it makes it possible. Um, and you, you run yourself lean <laughs> sure. and, 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 and so forth. And it's amazing what you can do. But also by being open and committing to try and finding a solution and putting the information out there, if you are wrong, you have the idea of the, the organization was that if you put the information out there, it's live and it's, it's unadulterated. Most of these significant findings we've had in the first four or five years was from the crowd monitoring our data whilst we were asleep. They go, something happened at this time overnight. And you look at it and you go, oh, my God, something really did happen. And what does it mean? And then you come up with a hypothesis and it's challenged, it, it, you know, but the people aren't being paid to do that. And my, my father always said um, a volunteer is worth 10 forced men. And it's absolutely true. A, a person yeah. who really wants to know, and they don't have to be asked, they don't have to be forced, they don't have to be under threat to find out the truth. They they will just research and research and research. It crossed my mind when I was reading about your, your group that it's a bit like a scientific Bellingcat. Are, are you following Bellingcat at all? I, I don't, please. Oh, uh, well, Bellingcat, you should look at it. It's a fantastic site. It's kind of a journalist's wet dream. Basically, what they do is they use open source information. And one of the things I was involved on the periphery of um, investigating the tragedy of the jet aircraft that was shot down over the Ukraine by the Russians. And uh, there were a lot of Australians on board. And so we were desperately keen to try and prove and hear proof as to who the the perpetrators were. And it, it actually was a plucky little Brit who, in the middle of some suburban town in England, sat down and started using things like, firstly, Google Maps. And there were a couple of social media photographs that he found of a Buck missile launcher travelling through the Ukrainian countryside. And he had dates... And then he just started doing good old-fashioned OSINT, open source intelligence, just going through that open source intelligence. And finally, one of the big breakthroughs that he got was he found the Facebook page of a Russian paratrooper who was operating this Buck missile launcher. And the metadata for the photograph placed him in the location where the missile was fired. And really exciting stuff. And a lot of that work has been done by people sitting at home on computers, nerdy types like you and me who just basically sit there and go through data and find satellite photographs and telemetry that people didn't even know existed as ways of further proving a thesis, a hypothesis. And um, it's really exciting. And it, it struck me a lot of what you're doing with um, the, yeah. the project is, is very similar. And... Um... It, it, but it's it's there's less available information on um, data aggregators like that. But there there is a now a more than three decade extremely detailed set of papers. And whilst you, I think at the conference at ICCF seventeen in two thousand twelve in South Korea, there were probably one hundred and thirty plus theories of how this worked. And many, many of the theories worked in different situations. So one theory would work with solid gas, one would work with gas gas, one one would work with liquid gas, you know, but, but they wouldn't all explain all of the phenomena. Yet you were getting, if you actually paid attention, similar transmutations in, in different systems. And so why, why, why isn't there not a common thing that's going on and and so on. So and 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 it w it was clear that it was likely that people had the r certain threads were partially correct. And I, I said probably maybe six years ago that this will be the last great thing that's discovered by man, because everything else will be discovered by AI. That's a big call. Oh, I see what you mean. Okay. Ah, oh, okay. Right. Because. I've got you. Because when all the data is available to a machine, it can find the patterns almost Im immediately. Yeah. And, it, it, and it, the, the answer drops out of the bottom. So what we've been effectively doing is, is creating a hive mind, which is effectively learning all of the data, challenging it, and only the answer drops out the bottom. So we're 
we, we, we are intelligent before we get replaced by artificial intelligence. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I, th I don't think we should be frightened of that because I think you're absolutely right. I, I mean, I, I thought initially you were going to say that there were no more scientific discoveries to be made, but uh, no. I, 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 but no, I, I agree. I think AI will probably crack it from this point on. But, but, it, um, but fortunately, I think it has been cracked, and 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 I think that's going to become increasingly clear. So back okay, to so my just story, to, this guy, yeah, this guy, yeah. he kept telling me. I had to go and watch the serious disclosure. And I thought, oh, what's not going... that Stephen Greer thing, really? It doesn't matter. Listen, yeah. it doesn't matter. Because I, I, I'm not into UFOs. I'm not thinking about anti-gravity. I'm not thinking about any of that. He just keeps on saying, you need to go and see this. You need to go yeah. and see. It's like, it's like a little birdie in your ear, you, you know. And I'm going, okay. And I, I actually run my life on a need-to-know basis. Yeah. Um, but then I think late 2016, I thought this really has implications for potential gravity modification. Um, wh why is this guy keep telling me to go and look at this, this series? And I actually didn't know it was, I can't recall whether I know, maybe I did that it was Stephen Greer, but anyway, I went and looked at it and I go, well, I know how that works. <laughs> Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> so so and it's like now I understand it. But that is, that is one reveal for you that sure. that I, I finally gave in to someone who is constantly being a little birdie in my ear, saying I needed to go and look at this. I needed to go and look at this. I needed to go and look at this. And at some point, it's like some point in the universe is channeling through him to tell me to do that, whether it's right or wrong. I, I, I need, at least need to give him the courtesy of, of looking. Sure. Now, what he didn't know is what I'm about to tell you now. He does know now. And in fact, he's the first person outside of uh, personal family that knows this. And you are going to be the second. And everyone that listens to this podcast is going to be whoever they are. <laughs> I'm, I'm flattered. <laughs> right. So the, the point is, is this, is when I was seven or eight, but your, your memory is may may or not be fixed on a, a an age at that point but i'm 49 now so so i would suggest at least 40 plus years ago my father who was um he was a very senior mason within the masonic system um at, at one point he said he was the most senior mason in the uk he was certainly beyond oh, wow. the grand master Gee. but he he was um he was the oldest. <laughs> I think he meant most senior, as in I'm the oldest at the moment that is a Grand Mason, something like that. He, was, he died at 72, so it's, it's a little bit hard to believe. But, you know, sometimes uh, family members embellish things. But certainly I knew he had been a Grand Mason. And he said for whatever reason that I was suitable to go into the lodge when I'd passed my 30th birthday or whatever. And I said, Dad, that's not my path. I said, I, I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure that's not my path. That's exactly what I said to him. And so um, having seen this documentary, having had this guy in my ear for years, say, you must go and see this, you must go and see this. And he goes, oh, God, OK, I'll see it. <laughs> I then have to tell you the story. And so my father, it was a late summer's night and um, cloudless sky. And my father asked myself and my family members to come downstairs. And we had like a, a, a big room with, which used to have our black and white TV in with the three channels <laughs> and a nice open half fireplace where our dog used to set itself alight. And I'm looking out the window uh, and he says, right, look up there. And way, way up into the sky, way beyond where the clouds would normally be, four lights go bing! on and they're in perfect equidistant formation they go zip, zip, zip. and for those that don't know what i'm doing with my hands i'm gesturing jerky instantaneous moves to the left to the right to the left or right to the left to the left, right depending on your perspective <clears throat> and then they all blinked off and he said right kids you can go to bed now so okay now you've got me really going how did he know they were going to be that's there? the point <laughs> 